You ready? Very good. Welcome everybody. Last meeting of the year. Welcome to our December 13th. I hope everybody has a blessed and merry Christmas and happy holidays, whatever you observe, and a happy new year. So with that, I'd like to start off with the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, we have some guests with us this evening. Uh, every year, our village of Rhinebeck Fire Department elects new officers, and I think it's an honor to have them here this evening to recognize their service to our community, their dedication to what they do, their passion for responding and protecting us, and so I would like to honor them by formally recognizing them this evening as part of the new elected officers for the Rhinebeck Fire Department. So, a new chief, please come up to Brian Knapp. Assistant Chief, Peter Fraley. <laughs> Under fire, Todd's not here, right? Todd Leary, not present. Shane, not here. First Lieutenant, Blake. <laughs> EMS, I think most people know. Jeff Connor. First Lieutenant, Erica Wheeler. Yeah. I don't see Tim. Our, and then we have a civil office as well. So President, new President elected, Walter Cotter. <laughs> I'm not going to introduce the next guy, but I will. Vice President, Sonny Freeman. <laughs> Financial Secretary, Leanne Pitcher. <laughs> Treasurer, John Imbrato. to round it out. Director is Jim Rogers and second director is Jamie Freeman. All right. I'd like to make a motion to accept the new fire captains and fire marshals and EMS and civil for the village of, for the year of 2023 for the village of Rhinebeck Fire Department. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Rick. All in favor say aye. 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 Very good. Thank you, guys. I'm looking forward to a great year. town board meeting in the town of Red Hook this evening so we're putting him up front to talk about an agreement that he's worked on for probably over a year with Spectrum and the new Spectrum contract and it's been out to the board for the review we can summarize that if you would like but I think Robert I'm going to turn the stage over to you if you could come up to the podium sure. I'd like to welcome Robert McCann town of Red Hook supervisor <laughs> First of all, thank you very much for having me here, and uh, it's too bad that the uh, folks from the fire company have already left. I would like to congratulate them because mutual aid is so important to our community and to others, and so we appreciate their service. Um, <laughs> boy, Gary, I wish it was only a year. Um, <laughs> it's been several years, um, as you all know. Uh, the last agreement, at least for the town of uh, Red Hook, was back in the early 90s um, with uh, then, I think, was uh, TCI, Time Warner uh, Cable, and uh, now it's Spectrum. And so uh, years ago, I was anointed 
be careful what you offer. Um, I was anointed the uh, representative to uh, get the negotiations started for the five municipalities of Panda, the village and town of Rhinebeck, the village and town of Red Hook, and the village of Tivoli. And um, it's been uh, several years and actually three uh, government reps uh, later for the cable company. And um, we have finally reached a point where we have an agreement. And I will tell you, we had an agreement in principle quite some time ago, but um, the lawyers representing both the town and, and the cable company, um, you know, went back and forth on some of the language, uh, mostly uh, dealing with notifications. Um, these agreements are actually very basic at this point. Most of it is regulatory. Um, and uh, uh, the PSC really uh, determines uh, sort of the guardrails of where they can operate and how uh, you know, we can obtain franchise fees and what the limitations are for that. Um, very important for the folks at home, if you've been watching Panda uh, all these years, you realize that Panda is uh, at the moment not on our local uh, channel. And that is because the equipment that they've had, which is supported by uh, the franchise fees that each municipality receives um, is very outdated and has actually failed at this point. And so very important that we uh, continue to move these agreements uh, forward. In um, this agreement that we have, which I would suggest you use as a template for your municipality or starting point, maybe it's good enough for you. Uh, your attorneys will, uh, I'm sure, uh, want to chime in. Um, this agreement includes funding for uh, the equipment necessary and updates the equipment and brings it to, uh, if not state of the art, certainly very close to it. So the uh, user experience on uh, the local cable channel will be a lot better uh, for mm -hmm. folks. So with that being said, any uh, questions from anyone? I'd like to open up the board first. Uh, uh, if they have questions, who have had chance, they've had a chance to review the agreement to, to ask their questions. So just for clarification, this is only for the agreement with charters, only for the hardware. The ongoing um, operating budget is supplied by the five uh, municipalities. That's right. So I think I forwarded to you a draft that well, we're going to um, start with, perhaps, for the agreement between the municipalities for funding. Um, as you know, Panda has not had an increase in funding for six or seven years now, so that's included sort of an updating of, uh, of current costs for that. So that is separate and apart the, the municipalities uh, amongst themselves, yeah. Right? So I went down the rabbit hole on this about wow. eight or nine years ago, yeah. and what I ran into was that the Public Service Commission said that the, the contract would automatically renew um, yeah. So it was sort of like it, would, it didn't incentivize them to sit at the table. We were trying to get some more goodies for the pan new equipment. Yeah. And so then maybe a year or two later, they sent a uh, standard, one of their standard boilerplate deals. And then I sent it to a telecom consultant. And he looked at the definition of gross revenue. And we had the best definition you could ever have here with our existing old, old, old agreement. And that he said that we would actually make less money with that 5% multiplier, given the new definition that, that um, Time Warner was proposing. You're talking so, about the new definition of this agreement? Gross, I don't know about yours. Yeah, okay. Um, I, Again, I think a lot of this is controlled by PSC and what they're allowed to yeah. include in the definition. But you can, I think a lot of it was the QVC revenues and the home shopping stuff. That, like our definition of gross revenue had that in there and that they tried to kind of remove that in, their, mm -hmm. in the draft that they sent me. So yeah. if we would look at this, I would really like to send the, send the draft to this upstate consultant just for a, a quick look after he gives me sure, a yeah. quote. I don't think he would charge very much money at all to look at this, look this over. But yeah, I think you, you, you want to put this out to whoever can give you some yeah. meaningful um, advice on this. Um, you know, that said, um, you, you don't want it to take a few years like it did with our municipality, and there are obviously some costs associated with legal and other reviews. So. Um, they, you have to weigh that, that cost-benefit analysis, and again, 
the PSC. And that 50 some odd thousand for the, 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 stu the goodies, that's just your proportionate share, just for no, that your would, community? That's for the whole? That's for the, the, that's for Panda. So that would be the entire capital contribution, which I know is not, is not impressive, but it does mean it does a lot of, yeah. And I so think, where did those numbers come from, Robert? Was yeah, that from Panda? It came from Panda. Okay. And, and, that, and those specific pieces of equipment that are identified in the contract from Panda. Okay. So. And then 54,000 <coughs> is provided by Spectrum. Spectrum. And that's not a municipal fund. It's not fund. a municipal fund. Yes. You will see, however, um, in the draft um, agreement between the municipalities, what I would ask you to take a look at in the near future, um, so we can move on that and we can get Panda up and running on the cable channel, that there is a small amount uh, reserved for future capital purchases, and this is just a 10-year agreement. That, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. So us, to we approve it, or to all of the five municipalities approve it, that 54000 for Panda is in limbo. Is that correct? That is correct. So we're... I think if there's an important aspect to this, that we work hard to get Panda back up and operational as quick as possible. Um, because we have the approved, as a village, we're on a different cycle than towns. We've had funding in our budget for this year that takes us until May uh, for Panda, and then we would go through our budget process to put that, put that forward. But I would like to make sure that we move expeditiously after taking this long to get Panda up and running. Yeah, because once you come to terms with um, Spectrum, they'll need to actually send the agreement to the Public Service Commission and they ultimately will sign off on it. And that tends to be about a 60-day window on top of it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for the folks at Panda that are still sort of waiting to uh, get, you know, basics, um, you know, it's important that we move as expeditiously as we can. So being it just be a draft document, we're not accepting this document, but I would like to make a motion that we go forward with the board. Brent, if you want to take it out to an external source, but I'd also like to make a motion to take it to our legal counsel to start the review process as well. Can you give me a budget? Say $700, if it's under $700, I have the authority to let it get started, or? You want to make a motion to do that? Could I tag that onto your motion? Sure, yeah. Second for both. Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 And let's move with expedition. Okay. Robert, want to do any questions? questions? Wait, one question. Sure. <laughs> why why ten, not five? <clears throat> uh, you know, the, the previous agreements have um, successive periods of five year terms, which is how we got to this point. Um, that was in, in the compromising with the cable company, they really said that we're, we're not signing five year agreements, we're signing 10 year agreements. Um, you know, one of, the, one of the problems we face is there really isn't any uh, competition here, at least for the cable aspect. You know, the internet aspect, you know, we're starting to hear other companies who are interested, but of course, you don't get franchise fees for uh, internet service that's provided by somebody else. That's different regulation. Who have you heard is uh, interested in Red Hook? I'm curious. So, uh, for, for providing internet yeah. service? Yeah. Uh, I think they've been down your way, haven't they? Archtop? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Who is it? It's called Archtop Fiber. Or fiber? Yeah. And so they're going, they've met with the town of Red Hook. They came here. Uh, my response to them was I think, believe that similar to this, we as municipalities should get together before we go individually one-on-one -on -one with them uh, to have that have those conversations, conversation, so. Yeah. <clears throat> well, thanks very much for having well, me. Well, is there any questions in the audience about? Anybody? Spectrum? Eric. Eric. Yeah, um, Eric Steinman from the Hudson Valley Pilot. Um, I just want to get some clarity on the 54,000. Uh, my understanding is that this server failed with Panda. Is this? going to cover the cost of a new server as well as uh, new software? Because that's included, yeah, that's included in the 54,000, yeah. Does it also include the, uh, for lack of a better term, the sort of Panda 2.0? It does. Okay, so that's, that's the um, sort of, that's the production of the app as well? 
Okay, to reach a larger audience. So it won't be limited to channel 23. It will not be limited from my understanding okay. chapter 23. <clears throat> There's different features they're looking at. Closed captioning is included in the budget that's being proposed, which I think we would be interested in. It, in our and it's still going to be a 5013C, correct? Panda will be operating. I as don't as see any reason why it wouldn't, but I can't really speak for Panda. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Well, thanks for having me. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. Good luck at your board meeting. See you. Okay. okay. Um, as we like to put presentations up front, the next presentation is from David Asher uh, on talk about senior housing. Uh, we just remind everybody, we last month was it? We had Christine, Krista Heinz in to talk about affordable housing. Uh, we also want to talk about senior housing. Thank you. Give me a second to boot up my computer, I guess. And David, please do introduce yourself. Yeah. So I'm David Ashen, and I live on, some of you know me, I live on, can you hear me? Yeah. Sorry. Is that mic on, David? Yes. There's a little switch on the floor. Yes, there you go. Um, I live at 54 South Street in the village of Rhinebeck and have been here for almost 10 years, very happily. Um, I have a company called Dash Design and um, we design a variety of things. My, I don't specialize in one thing, but I do a lot of hotels and restaurants. In the last couple of years, I've been very interested in senior housing. Um, and I formed a nonprofit two years ago, which is a think tank called the Ageless Living Collaborative, which selfishly was a way for me to learn more about senior living because I am no way an expert about it. But I have, a, I have a board of people who are experts, who are thinkers, who write policy, who design um, and work in all different aspects of senior living. So um, I will jump in. How many of you, I mean, what, it's, a, it's a broad question, but what is your knowledge of what you think of senior? communities. <laughs> it was about where I was. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yes. Do you know the average age um, in which people move in? So there, there's what are called age-restricted communities, which people think of senior living, which are 55 and over communities, which really aren't senior living, senior communities. They provide um, places for people who are near retirement, um, 55, um, but they don't provide services. So when we think of senior living, we think of more of traditional models, and I'll show you an example of a traditional model. This is one which I just finished, which is a tower, but these um, communities tend to have three levels of, of um, tiers of living. Um, there's independent, is a non-licensed type of housing um, community. Um, non-licensed is important to understand. So they, they provide uh, communal services like meals, uh, communal spaces, it's a place where people can socialize, and residents can have um, their own caretakers, but the staff cannot provide care uh, without being licensed. Um, you'll see places like um, Holiday in Poughkeepsie is an independent living community. Um, I've worked with Holiday um, that's more of middle class, um, and you get to places like this, which is more upper middle class to upper class, which provide a lot of facilities, and you'll see in the last 20 years really an evolution in what people what what, what we're designing now um, so they look like resorts um, super communal this is a uh, this is an assisted living dining room this is independent living when you get up to assisted living you require licenses um, but you also have higher level of service um, there's a lot of stigma attached um, the average age of people moving into independent living do you guys know what the average you have a guess on the average age of people moving in independent living 78 about 82 mm -hmm. um, wow. so people tend not to move unless they have to so one of the things we're trying to do is change that paradigm and there's also um, some of the things we focus on is uh, aging in place and providing resources and technology and information for how people can also age at home which most people a lot of people prefer to do um, isolation is a big issue with seniors, so communities provide a place where people can thrive um, and socialize, which is very important um, for all human beings. Um, this is an example of a newer community. What's 
uh, I thought it would be really interesting to share with some other typologies, which are residential typologies. And in you know, uh, a village like Rhinebeck, um, there are some opportunities um, to do this in what's called, this is a, called a small house model. And it's a very interesting model. It's a footprint. Um, in this one, we have about one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There, there are eight residents, um, guest rooms, basically apartments. They're, they're, they're bed bedrooms with full bathrooms, uh, communal living spaces. But this would be a um, assisted living model. Um, and what it does, it's a 3,500, depending on the size of the unit, to 8,000 square feet, depending on, on if it's eight to 14 rooms. Um, but provides full level of service and care, but in a uh, residential model. So this could be plopped down on a residential building site, a house could be converted. Um, what is nice is it is a very um, communal model, so they will have someone who cooks dinner for the residents, uh, provides their medication, provides assistance, um, but it fits very nicely into a community like ours or other communities. And it's a model that can be um, People think, well, how do we afford to do it? They're, they're, it's a model that can be financially viable. Um, and there are different grants um, that states give out, especially when it re um, involves um, affordable housing models integrated into uh, senior housing. Um, so what's really nice about this model is that, as it says here, smaller environments, consistent staff, um, a family, so it's not the caretaker and the residents, but people are more familiar in there. Um, these tend to be a little more curated when you think about the residents. If you have eight people living together, you want to make sure you have the right mix of eight people living together. Um, and it also allows for integration into a community and more socialization. Um, this is a model called the household typology, which really takes the small house model and it's kind of a conglomerate of a series of smaller models connected through a shared, um, basically back of house and shared um, services and, and teams. So this one is a model of, uh, this is, I should know, two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve. 12. This is about 14 around common um, areas. So you have a dining room, a kitchen again, um, and communal spaces. But it's also connected to another module. Um, so again, you get more of a smaller community and more support. You have shared resources in terms of the staffing, um, but it's again a more residential uh, and communal way of living. So again, these are some images from some of my colleagues of some of the places. So this is just some of this is from a presentation we did, which was kind of senior living 101. I won't read through the whole thing. Um, does anyone have any questions about these two models or anything I just asked, Gary? So yes. Um, so we have the facility Brookmead, yep. uh, which provides some similar aspects to this as well in, in Rhinebeck. Right. Right. Um, which is integrated out into their complex. Um, so you view that as an aspect of similar to this. Brookmead. Brookmead's a little larger. Um, it's, it's, I don't think it's a household model. It's a more traditional model, though it's not as many rooms. Um, but they also have independent living and assisted living, I believe. Right. They, they have memory care. I don't know if they have memory. They might have memory care too. We, I don't know when third. we get to that third stage, but yeah. I, knew, I do know that Ferncliff had just added a memory care unit. Yeah, well. yeah, and, and and Ferncliff is a little different. Ferncliff was always is more of the what is traditional nursing home model. Correct. Yeah, um, and and the challenge always in this is how do you, which I think is a very interesting challenge, is making sure you can try provide uh, housing for all, across all economic, you know, uh, levels. And people tend to look at um, the um, fancier communities that think it's only for the wealthy. But there are companies like Holiday, who is owned by Atria, which is one of the largest um, owners of senior living in the world now, that are, are looking at, and, and Holiday's focused on working class families, um, seniors, and upgrading the standard in, in the communal spaces. But the goal is to try to provide services and a lot of people live healthier lives. And in that, I'm oh, sorry, you're gonna ask? Oh, I didn't like that. Um, are there any working models of the household? Yes. I'm just curious where they are. I can get you, we have one of the people on our board who owns a bunch of small house models, and I was gonna to talk to, there's a very interesting um, organization called, which is at the end, 
called um, Live Together. Sorry, these are just And Live Together is founded by a woman named Jane Rohde. And Jane Rohde is a proponent of inter inter intentional community or, or intergenerational housing. She's worked a lot on um, developing a number of uh, small house models as well as household models and writes policy for the government. It'd be an interesting person to get in to, to talk about it because she knows all the how to dig into it. But the concept of the community model is in her company, her company, her organization is called Live Together, which people can Google because a lot of very interesting information about Live Together. Um, but really the proponent of integrating the small house model into other housing types so you have a community and you can pull resources um, and train people to help take care of, of, of some of the seniors in the community, but you also um, build relationships that are multi-generational. So if you think of, I don't know, you can think of, um, you know, I, I, I know, off the top of my head, like the, the, the worker housing that is, the um, workforce housing that's being planned for Rhinecliff, the interesting place to think about, you know, would there be a component or a small house model nearby where there you can get resources um, and shared resources, but also build community between the multi-generational um, housing types. Um, so intergener intergenerational living is a very interesting paradigm. Um, and again, you can go to uh, the site and I can get Jane in to talk to you guys if you're interested, but it does um, build really dynamic um, opportunities for communities. Um, <clears throat> So these are some of the benefits of intergenerational living. Workforce development, learning opportunities within environments, safe house, uh, consistent housing for youth, elders, and students. So you really build. And it's, it's more common in, uh, if you go to um, European cities, especially in the Netherlands, where you see more uh, mixed housing, both um, socioeconomic as well as um, um, generational. Um, this idea of removing isolation, so not ghettoizing seniors is, is actually quite important and very interesting. And more seniors, as you know, are moving. I mean, people are, when I moved to Rhinebeck, a lot of people moving at the time were empty nesters who were interested in being part of a community and being able to walk to the, to the town. Um, so there are different challenges, and there are a lot of people who have aged here who have large houses and, and, and don't necessarily want to leave the village. And Brookmead is a really nice alternative. There's also there's also the Watermark, which is in um, Millbrook, which is also um, has uh, independent and assisted living. It's a little spread out. Um, that's a more traditional thing. But the idea of thinking about senior housing in a community like this in a small house model or a household model could be a very interesting, um, I think, uh, solution for a lot of the people who are aging in Rhinebeck because you keep them in the village or close to the village. Um, you keep them close to where they spent 30, 40, even 10 years. Um, and it gives them the opportunity to um, age comfortably um, in a location or even, you know, what's, what's it? Um, this organization is also looking at um, its ties to the Village to Village Network, which we are very lucky because we have Ryan Beck at home, which is part of the Village to Village Network. So Nina and that group do amazing work. Um, so how you can start to think about these resources and creating community and new housing types that might support um, seniors. So I, that's just kind of an overview without getting too heavy into it from someone who's a little bit of a novice but has been working on um, designing these for the last three years. I, I designed um, about five or six of them at this point in the last two years. Um, and there are interesting programs with the state and the government to help subsidize some of these things. What about design-wise? Like, I'm just curious, are there certain needs when it comes to designing interior spaces, either architecturally or with the furniture, that are, are there certain codes that these different types of senior housing have to meet? Well, everything has to be ADA, number one. Mm -hmm. And you'll notice it's like when you get to mm -hmm. um, uh, the seating, um, Furniture has to be really well considered. Um, so furniture heights are different. Making sure, if you look at furniture, most things have arms. Um, as you design the public spaces, making sure there's enough um, pathways. Um, I was just in um, 
one property I was finishing up in Pennsylvania and I was establishing, you know, you look at people are walkers, they're in scooters, and you need to look at around, and they want to be active, they don't want to be hindered by something in the way. Um, if you think about the small house model, you know, in an area where you want to potentially, you don't have a large building, so if you do it two stories, you need to put an ADA compatible elevator in. Um, colors, light, natural lights are important. A lot of times seniors don't get out as much. So bringing the light in or providing places they can go and be outdoors, a lot of people think about that. Um, a lot of the things we think about also are, you may not think about, but you know, art programs, um, you know, in terms of what is the um, art and accessories in there. Um, seniors don't see color as vividly, so when you think about color, um, um, thinking about how color might be slightly distorted, um, lighting, Artificial lighting is super important. Um, you know, sound transmission, because as we all get older, most of us, I mean, I know I sit in a restaurant and things are echoing, so um, how do you allow people to hear conversation across a dinner table? Um, and that has to be very thoughtfully thought of. Um, and then places, the thing that's really crucial is, is a lot of time, as, as people age, their families don't want, they find it depressing to go. So it's providing places. Uh, one of the things we did here in uh, the tower I did in Atlanta was um, ground floor is an open cafe that's on the street. So people can come with their families, their grandkids. And it's a pleasant place to hang out. Um, so thinking about places where families can gather and, and be together, public spaces, but also not annoy the residents. So. There's a balance because it's also the private. So this has public spaces downstairs and then public sp uh, common spaces for the residents above. Um, patterns can be very confusing, but we do have a strong pattern on the floor. Tim, when you get into areas of memory care, you have to be very careful with colors you use and patterns because people will see things that are not there. You know, a, a, a large black pattern in the carpet looks like a hole, and someone who has dementia or Alzheimer's won't walk across it. Um, so there, there's lots of things, but I think what is um, the challenge is always uh, making sure that you're providing the appropriate level of care and designing a place where people are going because they want to go rather than they feel like they have to go and it's their last stand. Jane Rohde told a very interesting story about one of her small house models that she did. There was a woman who uh, was in her uh, late 80s. Um, I forget what was wrong with her, but she being immobile. They moved her to, from her house because they needed higher level of care. They moved her to a small house model and uh, she started to engage with the rest of the community and she started to walk her gun and she was able to go home, which they thought would never happen. So socialization is super important. Um, yeah. is, is there a minimum size that, or, or, or is, there, is, is, that, is there a si critical mass that's needed for one of these? Um, projects, either the household or this larger project? Yeah, small house model tends to be a minimum of eight. I think 12 is a sweeter spot for that. Um, when you get into the larger communities, the ones I've been working on are 50 to 100. Household model depends how many modules and what the staffing is. The challenge people are having right now is in the cost of staffing. Um, so I work with uh, Blackstone Group, uh, which owns a lot of their huge company. Um, and their, their challenge right now they with their portfolio with not people um, because we thought there was a big downturn in people pulled their families out of basically their parents out of communities during COVID. So I thought the issue might be in, in re-renting them, but the issue is the staffing model is complex. The small house model tends to be a little bit simpler and, and Jane and um, Gary, I forget Gary's last name who's on our board um, is one of the developers of that, that technology. So I could always get data, a lot more data for you. Just kidding. Yeah. All right. Thank you, David. Any questions from the public? I just have a question for clarification. The small house model, how does that differ from, say, a board and care facility? A board and care facility? Yeah. I don't know what a board and care facility is. Oh, um, it, it's from what you're describing, it's very similar in that it's usually anywhere from five to eight residents with a, a sort of rotating staff, but it's usually they convert a house or you know residential property to a place that is ADA compliant where um, residents of varying degrees of mobility can, can live. It's probably similar. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, John. Gary. 
Nice to see you. I was just kind of curious how our zoning would accommodate, or might I suspect not accommodate, uh, small house zoning or small house model. So we go by dwellings. So if there was a dwelling, uh, we don't restrict the household size. Uh, I think that there's a constitutional issue with that too, with a Supreme Court case from uh, Ohio. So my, that's, that's my quick answer, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we don't restrict that. I had a question about the, does the, the funding mechanism, does it go with the individual in the form of a voucher or does it go to, with the real estate to the developer? The developer. Okay. Yeah. The, the, it goes to the developer and their grants that go directly to the developer and tax incentives. The, that's from the like the same the similar tax incentive program that you have with the funds workforce housing. Yeah. It's just on a smaller level. Huh? Smaller level. Yeah. That's really neat. And the, the state in New York tends to be a little more difficult with licensing, but they tend to be very pro if you include um, uh, affordable housing and senior housing. Then they be they they, they tend to be um, uh, more proactive and more amenable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Hope that was very important. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, the next part of our agenda is a public comment. Is there anybody here that would like to make a public comment? John. Good evening, everybody. Hi, John Rossi, 53, by the place. Um, just want to make a quick comment, uh, question on the ADA, <coughs> excuse me, related resolution that's on the agenda for this evening. And just by quick background, um, I do a lot of volunteering for a disability advocacy group located in Poughkeepsie. And one of the things that we did several weeks ago was we sent out letters to any village or town in Dutchess County um, that we perceive had a potential non-compliance, and uh, I'm not going to read the whole letter, but just very quickly, we referenced some material from the Department of Justice that a small town has to provide notice to the public about its ADA, Americans with Disabilities um, Act obligations. Uh, and uh, that requirement is usually satisfied by a simple posting on a website. Uh, so we sent a letter uh, to anybody, any municipality in, in, in the county, that um, we, we couldn't find the letter. You know, we couldn't find the information on the website. Uh, and that included our village, that included our town, and in fact, uh, Supervisor McKean just mentioned uh, his awareness about it, and that, you know, that they've taken care of it, and I'm happy to say that the village is also taking care of it. Um, so I wanted to be clear that no one is saying that there was a non-compliance, and if there was a non-compliance with this particular requirement, that it was, I'm sure it was really, it was certainly without any malice. But at the same time, I would just share that uh, there are 30, roughly 30 towns and villages in Dutchess County, and we couldn't find any of them that had this information posted, not one. So we made 30 outreaches, which is quite a bit. And we heard back from several of the town of, uh, of Northeast, uh, uh, the village of Tivoli, village of um, Millbrook, uh, uh, Robert, um, and, um, and people were, uh, and the, the municipalities were actually pretty glad that we reached out. Uh, and the action that's being taken by the board today is perfect, the, the, the uh, resolution. Um, so that's all good. Uh, the only question I have about the resolution was uh, there's no reference, and maybe this is already the intention, but, but that information does have to be posted publicly. So uh, my question is, will that be posted on the village's website? If adopted, absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for your time, everybody. Have a good holiday. Any other public comment? Harry Dunn, we're going to move on. Thank you. Uh, Treasurer's report, Kara. Hey, Treasurer's report is for the period ending November 30th. The general fund ended the month with $150,333.47. The water fund ended the month with $148,116.23. And the sewer fund ended the month with $249,974.32. Uh, vouchers presented for payment in the general fund total 274403 
in the water fund, 75,103.69. In the sewer fund, 44,734. We have a water treatment plant upgrade for 13,996.88. Wastewater treatment plant upgrade project, $6,305. A couple bills for the frost grant of $5,440. An escrow of $3,205. An operating statement is provided uh, for the revenue and expenditures through December 13, 2022. Um, just a little in informational on the um, mortgage tax. We received our mortgage tax for April to September of 2022, and it totaled $30,348, and for the same time frame last year was $47,000. 523 so we'll need to monitor that and kind of keep that in mind when we go into our budget for next year just to see what the trend's going to be and what we have coming up mid-year december marks the mid-year for the villages um, fiscal year i will be working with the department heads on their budgets and prepare a six-month report for the january meeting um, muni link Invoice Cloud and Neptune 360, our water and sewer billing software. Um, our first complete billing will be going out in January. Um, we are progressing January's bill, maybe a week late um, if we have some problems reading the meters, but we're hoping to get the meters read in the next two weeks, but it's been a little challenging. Um, water and wastewater, uh, billing and adjustments, um, have been reviewed and signed off by Trustee Nunaker and are presented for authorization. I'd like to get the water and wastewater adjustments uh, approved as submitted. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay, and I just have uh, just a couple budget amendments just for the um, planning and zoning um, in contractual expense account in the amount of $625 each and taking that from the contingency for a total of $1,250 and that would be for the purpose to extract the property files and import them into Laserfish. Question, how much do we have to, off your head, you know what we have left in contingency? $22,500 minus $1,250. There you go, thank you, all right. Um, any other budget amendments? That's it. All right, I'd like to make a motion to accept the budget amendments as proposed by the treasurer. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Thank you, Chairman. Okay. Very good. Next, as uh, John Rossi just put, we have the Americans with Disabilities Act notice um, that was brought to our attention that we need to post and put on our website. It's not a matter of just posting this, it's a matter of going through the public review and accepting this as part of our uh, notice under the Americans with Disabilities Act. We worked with Nikon to get the formal wording that we needed to do to post this. Um, so what you have and you it posted and you have received is our version of what Nikon gave us to be able to post and, ex and accept this. That covers the employment, the effective communication, modification to policies and procedures, you know, and complaints, et cetera. And this was recommended by NICOM um, for us to adopt and to put and post publicly. So I'd like to make a motion to accept our version of the Village of Rhinebeck Notice under the Americans with Disabilities Act. Second. Any questions? All in favor say aye. 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 So posted. Thank you for letting us know. Welcome. Rick, I'm going to turn it over to you for the filming application. Okay. So um, this summer, as many people remember, um, on Chestnut Street, we had a, a bit of a situation where a very large film production came in. And um, what it pointed out to us is that our permitting application um, really wasn't up to handling a production of this um, style and size. So um, basically I went out to other local communities, Kingston, New Paltz, Saugerties, um, asked them for um, what they do, basically asked around for best of, and then um, 
took what I thought was the best of, of those applications and then talked to my wife, who's a filmmaker, and to Jonathan Burkhardt, who also lives here in the village and is a filmmaker. So uh, we went back and forth and um, kind of pared it down and edited it. This is basically designed to do a couple of things. If there is a production on site, there has to be a contact person on site. There's either a, if either a primary or a designated person. It has to be on site whenever the production um, is, in, um, uh, is, is, is ongoing. Um, if it's basically a simple student film, we do not charge a permit fee. Um, but if it runs into multiple days, and depending upon the size of the production, we are charging a permit fee. Um, we're asking for detail, much more details about um, where people are going to park and what kind of um, what kind of uh, uh, special effects are going to be used. Basically, trying to cover all of our bases, and uh, this re this requires to be filled. This requires is required to be filled out prior to the production. It's then going to go to um, the mayor, uh, our sergeant, um, the officer in charge, the fire chief, and the um, head of public works, so that they can all take a look and see that what's happening in the time space and in the frame is, um, is adequate. Um, this also does provide for notification of people in the area. So both by letter and by postings, actual physical postings in the area. So um, again, this is a, a best of that I saw from other, other communities and then vetted by my wife and John Burkhardt. So I'd like to present this to um, uh, I'd like to present this permit application um, for the village of Rhinebeck for filming, uh, which will include photography, uh, permits. Motion. It's a motion. I'll, show, I'll, I'll move to, uh, I will move that the village adopt this permitting process. I second it. That was good, very, very thorough. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, I like the, the lighting after 10 p.m. piece. It was good. Um, one question, what do, how do you, uh, productions typically handle garbage and recycling when they're on set? We ask them to police themselves, but in terms of their internal garbage recycling, I don't, I don't know. Okay. I don't know what they do for their own selves. Um, generally, the bigger productions have craft services, you know, food, um, and they would uh, handle that inside, so, but I don't know what they're generating. And there is nothing in this about that. And generally, I will say what we are attempting to do is understand the size and the scope of the production, making sure that there's somebody responsible around to take care of it, but we're not particularly getting involved in, in their operations. Okay. Um, only what we're really concerned about is impacts to the community, that everything is understood and that they're not, they're not adversely impacting the community. Or if they say, hey, we're gonna have to shoot in the middle of the night, then we're able to go out and speak to um, residents and find out if it's acceptable or not. So we want to work with production companies, but at the same time, you know, we need to make sure that the villagers can get a good night's sleep. So, and park. So that's what we're looking to do. So my other question is, lots of times we'll get requests, film production crews will come from the county. The county will be bringing them in and they'll be going around the county doing different things and they'll These come. the county Go county ahead. tour, Dutchess County Tourism will mm -hmm. bring film production crews in. That's part of what they do, mm -hmm. right? Um, so these are sponsored by the county, and lots of times uh, the county likes to negotiate a different rate because of what they're trying to do for promotion. I don't see any way within this to be able to negotiate something if we're coming from, a, for instance, a sponsored county mm -hmm. film right. production to be able to do that, and we get this question often when they come over, and we'll say, "No, there's a fee for this," and they'll go, "Oh, my, you know." So I would like to add a, a piece that, if there's an external, you know, provider or whatever, that we can negotiate the fee based on that. Okay, I can I can certainly work that into uh, work that into. I assume that we have the mayor's discretion to, to do it. However, yeah. you want to do it. You want to. Lots of times, the, the county gets a lot of benefits from doing sure. this, and we want to also help it's promote. Not, it's not. I mean, I, th I think the, the answer is oh, or not the answer, but um, this would be a non-commercial, not-for-profit use. Oh, maybe so. no, maybe a film production. It may be 
the one we had, well, if Vermont and Christmas oh, in well, Vermont. If it's, or a, if it's a film production, then they need to go. They need to go through this. But the but the county brings them in, and the county gets a lot of promotional activity from that, and so they're actively involved in working with them around the county. Okay, I, what I would say is I think we put together a very, a very fair schedule that has caps. Um, there are real costs to the community, and um, I think we should be cognizant of, of that, and uh, you know, maybe if there's a little negotiation, but I would hate to give away the store. I agree, but I would like to cover our real costs, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. We don't give away the store. We always cover a real cost, whether it's police or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but if, say, for instance, it's a, one of the larger ones, and uh, you know it's three hundred fifty dollars a day, and maximum thirty five hundred, let hear me out before you say no. <laughs> the county will often come and say, we even, you know, we would like to help promote this within the region to help tourism and improve um, the relationships that they have to bring more production companies into the county. $350 for its production of that size is chump change. I'm just telling you, we're going to get the request from. Okay. We're going to get the I mean, they, they, they can want it. I, I mean, I would say maybe we can have we can have this discussion later if you want to bring it forward. We can put that there. But the the we are asking basically nominal amounts compared to what their expenses are. Uh, all um, I would like to line is if if need be, we can negotiate okay. a fee. That's fair, all I'm fair, asking. Fair enough. We can put that in there. Okay. We can put that. There. But I think our our fees are very friendly, capped, um, and I think are quite reasonable. And I know. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Should we vote? Oh, please. I had a couple of comments. Uh, where did you get the insurance language from? Did you get it from a different? Again, no, that's from ours. That's our, that's our permit. That's okay, because the events code says a million, and then this is two. I don't know if two is difficult to get two million coverage for aggregate limits for bodily. Yeah, they probably don't get it, and we just this is accept what the certificate they give us. I don't know. I'd have to look at each individual certificate that they give us, but I can't say right now. <laughs> right. I don't know if it's difficult this to obtain that or not. To change it? I no, to get it for someone to get insurance at that level. If you're if you're a big production company, what if you're a little production? What if you're a little? Well, then 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 we maybe that's a case where we'd also look to negotiate. I mean, there is there is a provision in there, or at least we're trying to separate these major productions from small. We have we've had people come in they shoot for an afternoon, right? You know, we're not we're not trying to really hinder that kind of stuff. This is really aimed for these big productions that come in, and these are massive. But so maybe we should refine the wording here then, because this is for everyone. Right, okay. I mean, if we're already doing it, it's not consistent with the events code language, but it probably doesn't matter if, we are, if we're already doing it, it's okay. What's, I want to look at the, I will, I will make, I will harmonize it. With, with the, the events code language? Yeah, and what our current permit application is. I'm almost completely positive. I lifted this from our current application. But it should be consistent with the events code because it's under the umbrella of the events code. Okay. So you'll get my vote if you. I certainly will look. Certainly will look at that over. <laughs> I certainly look it over. Okay. Do you want to table this until we bring it back to next month meeting, and with the modifications? I'll do it either way. I mean, if I can table it, or do you want to do it? Well, minutes? I don't know if Brent wants to see the mounts first before we get before we vote. I think we should, and I think we should. I don't care. I mean, if we just push this one along, and then we're done with it, depending on what Rick does. All right. Um, we have a motion. We have a first. We have a second. All in favor of approving the film uh, application requirement with the amendments that we talked about in terms of negotiation, if need be, for production and the insurance adjustments, please say aye. 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 Very Thank good. you. Okay. Thank you. Grant, anything on the water plant? Uh, they're, they're working on drawings for the engineering changes, and they're going to, would like to present something next month, because they're going to have quite a lot to talk about. So that'll be a presentation for yeah. this meeting? Yeah. 
All right. Um, we're going to move on. Center Street, you all have the notice in terms of last month we talked about trying to move forward with our Center Street project. And we and we focused on what was called option three, which was Center Street water main and drainage improvements, no drainage, no curb, no water, made north of East Market Street Mill and overlay all of Center Street for a total of 670,000. Okay, so that's the one that we picked to move forward on. One of the action items that we took away was for Karen and I to look at how we can fund uh, this program. And you all have in front of you a funding recommendation to include uh, from the water fund, 220,000. From the ARPA funds, which is our balance, 232,773. And from our CHIPS, which is our current balance of $217,227 for a total of $670,000, which meets the quote for this. And so this is submitted with the caveat that understand that the water department also has a commitment to the upcoming water project. And this will use up the balance of the ARPA funds and will rely on a small portion of the CHIPS uh, for the 23-24 allotment, which would be in the thirty dollars to $40,000 range. So I'm really going to open this up to discussion first before we move on in case anybody, because this is an so important gonna, subject. So we're going to be borrowing in advance against CHIPS for the paving. No, we're not borrowing. We have the CHIPS money. Oh, I thought you said, but for 23, 24. So we probably won't get to it. So we, we will probably get those funds in the beginning of April. So I don't anticipate that we would be, re we would be, um, applying for a reimbursement from chips prior to that okay so yeah. we have like two we have a balance of two hundred and seventeen thousand. the regular chips allotment next year will be about seventy five thousand i have about fourteen thousand currently that i need to um request re reimbursement for so i i think i was just letting you know that there is current there is enough funds okay. so in other words this is a spring project so we talked about getting quite a lot of um, ARPA for the for the water line, and it looks like I've lost a lot of, or the water department has lost a lot of that. Well, we're using all of our ARPA funds for this project, correct? Right, but when then we're still we're still getting 220 from the water fund when it looks like um, the water piece of it is 211,450 dollars. Yes, yeah, so I'm not getting any ARPA money really at all. Uh, I guess how you want to interpret it. It's going well, to a project. Yeah. That's right. how I interpret it. Yeah, the project is kind of a whole package at this point. Well, we talked about how quite a bit of that was going to be from that. Well, without where I don't, from our this is our recommendation of where we can get the money. Yeah to complete this project. What was our total or bill? I, I, I get what we're here, but what was our total? It was like two sixty one. I mean we spent thirty thousand of it, so we have this two thirty two left. I mean we're gonna be looking at two million dollars more from the water plan upgrades. I've got the two hundred quarter of a million to remove the sediment at some point in the geotextile bags. Uh, I'm open to suggestions if you think we can find the money from somewhere else. Uh, we took the request and said, how can we find the money if we want to move forward? Because our goal was to start permitting in the month of December to give the engineers time to, so we can get ready for the spring. But like nothing's really coming from the general fund. Then. It's because you got 217 coming from CHIPS, 232 coming from ARPA, and the general fund's like, Skating. You want to comment on that, Karen? I mean, in terms of where we could find anything from the general fund, which is a very tight budget right now. I mean, I mean, we talked about the project as a whole. Um, the, regarding the water fund, I can say in this current year's budget, the um, the ESC paid an interest payment of ninety-eight thousand. So it's possible that we can. We did not have to spend that this year. We can pull that ninety-eight thousand, which would reduce this two twenty down in the water fund. Um, I mean, unless the board wants to borrow money. I mean, this this was just a recommendation to not have to go out and borrow money. 
because I know we're all going to get together at budget time because everyone has different projects that they're planning on, different grants, different village um, commitments to those different grants. So I, I think we're just kind of coming up with a way to do that. Well, didn't we pledge to put down 300000 on the... So we're not, there's not going to be much of a fund balance left if we... I thought it was 200, but not even 3. 3, I think. I don't was know. it 3 for the water, or did we commit a 3 for the wastewater? I'll have to look and see. I think it's the 3 for the water. Oh. Um, I mean, it needs to be done, I get it. Like, and remember, this is also assuming that uh, there's general conditions of, you know, in terms of, we're trying to be very conservative in this estimate of $670,000, but you know, we don't it's know. It's a contingency. We do have a contingency. Yeah. yeah. It's what, 15%? Actually, yeah. So basically, but oh, you're 20%. It, it, it's kicking the 200000 to the whatever we bond, whatever we get for our our, um, our bond for the for the water projects. The 200000 that you're talking about. Yeah. That would get kicked into being, to, it go, would be rolled that, this gets rolled into the amount of money that you're bonding for at some point? On our application with EFC, we we said you know we're going to do a down payment of three hundred thousand. Right, then and we're going to. It makes it more attractive. Correct. Right. So they thought we. I mean that makes your your grant request more attractive when you put some money down. Right, which we have. But I think what Rick, if I understand, you're saying to take this two hundred twenty and roll it into the big long-term debt when we do go to long-term debt on the big project Correct. that's that's what's going to happen and that's that's an option that's an option right. i mean I if all this open. starts happening at the same time um, can you bond can you do that with one project versus the other project based on their terms i'd have to see yeah the, i don't the terms of the right I'd have the to life, see the you've got to talk about the lifespan of the project in terms of when you well, look at right. well you would have the it's lifespan. a wash either way i mean whether we do it i think that's what Rick is together saying. separate yeah right in a way yeah i mean we can look at we can look at doing that but just to get mac for the public knows the bid is four hundred forty two thousand six hundred fifty and with the contingency it goes to six hundred seventy thousand dollars so that's why there's such a high amount here. And you definitely need the contingency because there's going to be some unknowns when you get Absolutely. a deal and all that. So. And we don't even know if we can get the bike yet. Or a bidder. Right. So what would you like to do? <clears throat> Kick the can down the road or move, try to move forward? I mean, if you agree in concept, uh, in concept of this, and Brent, you want to sit down and we can kind of go over the water part of it. I can show you, I know we have one more um, principal payment next year that EFC will be making as well, and then we're on our own after that, but maybe we can go through a, you know, we can create a long-term debt schedule and look at it. Yeah, I mean, I, I got to do this. I mean, we have to do this. And if we, so. you know, if we, you know, we have, we have a, okay fund balance in the water fund and if it goes down as a result of this we just have to start building it back up again i mean you know i mean that's what it's there yeah, for. yeah. We, our rate is really favorable i know some communities are like eleven dollars per thousand right. pounds and we're seven and, and our capital sort of our, our, our deferred capital maintenance is coming home to roost but we each have three million dollars in, in grants right so, all right all right. It sounds like I'd, like I'd like to make a motion that we accept uh, the funding recommendation from our treasurer for water fund, 220,000, ARPA funds, 232,773, and CHIPS, 217,227, and authorize time bond to move forward with getting a permitting. Second. Second. Any other questions? All in favor say aye. 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 Very good. Let's move it. Good job. All right, there is no update on uh, that I've received on any of our sidewalk grants uh, right now. So we'll hold on that. Um, 
Next one is 6 Mulberry Street. Just a, a note from David Gordon, um, our land use attorney. That sort of, I'll just read it in brief. According to the 1117 email, uh, the notice of intent to be lead was sent out on 1116, which we agreed we need to wait 30 days to hear from them. So basically, we're on hold until 1219 um, to hear terms of the responses. So far, I've seen a response from our planning board um, that would like the village of board to be the lead agency. They have not accepted it. And there has been a return from Dutchess County and their environmental review or in favor of it and moving the project, but they had some questions in regard to the um, septic proposal that, would that they said they would flush out during the process. So other than that, I've seen no other responses back yet but we're on hold until 12-19. So that means in January we'll be bringing this up. Okay? Any questions? All right. Lydia, uh, unfortunately, was not able to make it tonight, so the historic district discussion will be moved until next month. She has a draft that I was working on with her. And oh, do you want to summarize or do you want to wait for uh, No, we were just going over comments. Right. Um, it's It's a version that's not going to rewrite the whole thing it's, it's just some basic changes and i understand the planning board is interested perhaps in getting a pattern book which to help them with these decisions which shows the features and the of the inventory in the village and stuff to help them make these decisions about preservation okay we're going to move on to pending projects okay rick astor bridge Okay, I was hoping to have some graphic elements here, but it seems like we're not connecting, so I'm going to have to do this um, just uh, verbally. You can't so connect now? It, it, it wasn't happening. I was going to fool around. Um, the New York State Department of Transportation informed us that they're going to be replacing the bridge over the landsman at Route 9. And basically, if you're heading southbound out of the village, you come down past Legion Park. If there's a little bridge there. That's the bridge that's going to be replaced. That bridge is actually made up of two elements. One is the vehicular bridge, and the other is a um, separate pedestrian bridge with some green railings on it. Um, the, the history of that area, and I looked at this with um, Mike Frazier, is that those green railings are probably original to the late 19th century sometime. Um, there's been a series of pedestrian bridges in that spot we have some, some old photographs that show what pretty much looks like for, for, by the eyeball test, um, those railings. At the same spot, the, um, John Jacob Astor had also dedicated um, a bridge, and it, had, it was made from concrete, and it had a balustrated design uh, over the water course. So there was, if you want to think, like vases were holding up the, um, holding up the barrier. Um, the state came to us, and, and they also called in um, the State Historic Preservation Office. The current bridge that's there is not, the vehicular bridge is not historic structure. That is not the bridge that John Jacob Astor uh, dedicated that's gone. However, the pedestrian bridge with its green railings, or at least the green railings of the pedestrian bridge, are a contributing factor to the local historic district. So. With all of that in mind, um, the state came to us and with the historical, they said, well, here's our ideas for the bridge. And they wanted to have the bridge and basically get rid of the pedestrian bridge. And um, um, my response was, no way. Um, let's see what we can do. So um, I sat down with Mike Frazier, um, Kyle Amy, um, and eventually uh, pulled in a time bond. Um, to both uh, make sure we had additional information about the history of the bridge and to look at some possible designs for the pedestrian and the vehicular bridge that would go over, um, that, that would go over the water course. There. Um, I have a letter that I'm asking the board um, to approve, which is going to go to um, all of the participants. Basically, that is New York State Department of Transportation, New York State Historic Preservation Office, and the federal government is also involved in this. Um, and basically the request is that we have a concrete bridge uh, that is reminiscent of the Astor design uh, using a modern balustrated design. Unfortunately, um, the, ba 
balustrated designs that are currently out there do not meet the traffic safety requirements. Um, so we had to shift to something else, David. Um, excuse me, Mike Frazier and I had a, uh, a good conversation about it. So this letter basically says, uh, the village of Rhinebeck would like to see a bridge uh, that is at least uh, resonant with the John Jacob Astor design. Um, and we want to see a separate pedestrian walkway that continues to include um, those iron green railings. Um, and so that's where we're going to go and ask the state for. So with your permission, I'd like, I'd like, I asked, uh, we have Mike Frazier signing on to the letter, and I asked that the board and the mayor sign on to the letter as well. And you guys have a copy of the letter. I looked up the, the Texas C412 barrier. Yeah. That's really nice looking. It's, and is that a dual, do you think they're gonna? They use, it turns out Texas C41 is actually used, um, uh, yes, New York has experience with it. Okay. Um, and that's, it turns so out that it's possible. The, the Texas designs are well known and used. And I would say if anybody wants to see something similar, the bridge over at 9G over Route 308 is also a balustrated bridge and has an open design. So it'd be something like that. Um, that's what we're shooting for. Um, the other nifty thing about the Astor Bridge, um, as it said in a New York Times article, it was illuminated by electricity. There are actually um, four corner uh, lamp posts up on it, and uh, we did ask to have those um, re reinstated. And part of the issue here is besides maintaining the pedestrian walkway, which is very important and used by lots of people, and a separate pedestrian walkway, so it's a comfortable place to walk, um, we can help create a bit of a um, gateway marker for the south side of the village because we do have a problem where people come speeding down, you know, through that little valley there and then up into the village. And if we have uh, a more um, architecturally interesting structure that people will really see, they will get the message, you are arriving in Rhinebeck Village and you need to slow down. So. Um, that's part of what we would like to see done with this um, with this project. Um, these are all asks from that we're asking the Department of Transportation. We do have a little leverage because the pedestrian bridge is a contributing historic structure. It is not historic itself. Um, and SHPA was pretty clear that they wanted to see uh, a separate pedestrian bridge because there has been one there for 130 years. So that's. That's what, we're, that's what we're shooting for. I don't, I'm sorry. You go ahead. Um, so I remember a ways back we were talking about another bridge in the village, and, the, and it came to, to light that actually the town is in charge of bridges. Does the town have any relationship to this one, or is it? This is state? a state, state highway, state, state, bridge. state highway, state bridge. The municipal, our, our municipal bridges within the village are the town. So for instance, the one over at the Landsman yeah. at South Parsonage. That's the town. Okay, so the town doesn't need to be involved. The town is not involved. This okay. is completely us. But they are the, the one by the mini park. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And then one other quick question. I, I know we've been talking about complete streets and how to um, how to tie in sidewalks and bicycling. What's the plan for bikes? Do the... you want to? We can jump ahead if you we would can like. Jump ahead. Is that the Route Nine corridor yeah. discussion? Right. So right. I can leave ahead to that. So <laughs> if you want. No, let's pick that up after. Okay, so I would say that, that the the plan, at least that DOT is looking at, would be um, uh, they were looking at two 12 foot lanes, eight foot um, uh, median, you know, eight foot medians, barriers of the bridge, and then the separate bridge. So you'd have an eight foot, um, eight foot on either side, um, at least for for a bicycle. I just had a question about the, the that open barrier because mm -hmm. I know uh, the discussion was a safety factor, right? And this one is not the same. It's similar to the one over 9G, but they had an issue with the safety factor that we wanted to have. Well, but there was a the, right, the first L3, right? The first one, the first one, basically that even though the speed limit yeah, in the weeds, even though the speed limit down there is 30 miles an hour, the bridges are always built for one one speed limit higher, so built for 45, uh, basically a large truck at 45 miles an hour crashing into the barrier. The, there are currently concrete balustrated designs with the vase shape that would be much more 
like the original Astor Bridge, they are not crashworthy. Right, that's the point I want. Yeah, they are not crashworthy. That's why we're going to this other design. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I'd like to make a motion that the Board of Trustees and the, and the Mayor sign on this letter and I will send it tomorrow. Second. All the parties. I second it. Any questions? All in favor say aye. 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 Let's move ahead. Very good. Thank you, Rick. Um, emergency antenna, just a brief update. There was a question asked last time in terms about frequency interruption and we got a email from Nikon Co, which is doing the design. Just remember we have three current in parallel footprints for what we are trying to do to combine a police antenna and a fire antenna. There's currently the fire antenna, which is up off of Burger Road on a private property uh, that needs, the antenna itself structure needs to be replaced. Uh, and we looked at that and there was a $240,000 cost and now, and some additional cost into then to protect the landowner since it's on private property. We also are looking at the cell tower here, which has the approved height and will give us the same coverage of it. And we are also looking at a mast antenna that the fire company still has on the top of this building. So just so I wanted to make clear that what we're putting on there are not these big things that you see for cellular. Uh, in your package, you will see a picture of a vertical antenna, right, that goes on top of the cell tower, right, and it's attached to a post up on top. So it doesn't take away any of the space that's been vacated by any of the other carriers that are up there in terms of revenue. And they also said that the police frequency is 150 megahertz range and the fire department frequency is 450 megahertz. Uh, this is uh, lower down in the frequency spectrum from where all cellular frequencies start, which start at 800 megahertz and up, go up from there. So there should be no interference from the tower with the two lower frequencies and there's no interference in terms of the space. Um, and that all has to be agreed upon if a new carrier comes on and that an analysis is done. But so far we have not received a formal quote back from Nikon Co and Crown Industries of what we need to do or what it would cost to put that on there. We're still waiting for their feedback, but this is to answer the question of what it would look like on top of the tower, which is the antenna. And in your package, you will also see the frequency charts that are available to show the, the spectrum of where the frequencies are. The one is UHF. Remember UHF on the <laughs> <and> white television? <laughs> yeah, I do. Yeah. Uh, like this, right? So we have nothing to move on. It's just information now on that. So my concern, I talked to Pete, and he, he's really not looking at the mast tower right now. He's looking at the Crown Castle tower. Nikon Co. is looking at the mast tower, though. Okay. They promised to come back and tell us whether that would work as well. Okay. So, I, but I don't know the answer until we hear back from okay, that. Okay, because I have a strong preference for that if it works, just because the, the vertical. Is what you're yeah, the vertical separation district di uh, distance on on this tower might prevent an array from being able to a commercial uh, rent payer from going. But that's what I just said. They, Nikon Co said it would not. You still have a vertical yeah. separation distance with these things. Nikon Co said it would not. So that would not what? interfere with the vertical separation. And that no, but what I'm saying is the, the, the tower is crowded and then like every five five to ten feet is another array. Right. And, and you can't just put an omnidirectional ten two feet away. I just don't want to bump a carrier. I agree. Okay. We don't want to bump a revenue source and that's what we're trying to address with right. Nikon Co. Um, does Sprint still paying the rent on there? We're receiving the same amount. It has not been reduced. It's just really. Could we re rewind the tape? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So no action we taken there. Soho uh, water. Any updates? Yeah, we're working on that. They're requesting that we show them the uh, our copy of our withdrawal permit, which shows that um, we're permitted to serve that area, which is sort of the equivalent of asking someone who lives in an 1890s Victorian where their certificate of occupancy is. But uh, <laughs> so we're looking at records. I was in the basement. I did find a, a withdrawal permit from 1961. It had an exhibit 
that show that service area. So hopefully that will be helpful to Brandy. I left the box in uh, Martina's office. She came and took some things today. <laughs> and she, she got it. Um, and then she's going to foil that for DEC to see if they have some of our old withdrawal money. So we don't want it to be the bottleneck for uh, for SoHo. And so just to summarize for everybody, they came back based on the application the graduate put in and said that area is outside of our service area. Well, they asked yeah. us to show that it's not. Yeah. So they're saying that it is. And we say it is because we've always had water to Grasmere. And we were looking for the proof that it, it is there to avoid us having to go through the whole process to put it back on. Having the, the pipe in the ground is not approved. No. Okay. That's what I'm saying. It's right. like, you have to be approved by it has to be approved by the DEC to be able to do that. Okay. Even though the pipe is ground. At some point, we're grandfathered. Maybe the county has the records. You know what? They do have. I think they do have a lot of records. I found oh. some of that stuff in the basement. Hopefully it's all. But yeah, Brandon just told out. me to get the application for the DEC or whatever that one. Vanessa, Village Hall, Flex Tech Design. Okay, so this is the, the project to uh, take a look at Village Hall, which was built in 1970, and try to increase its energy efficiency. It has an old oil burning furnace in the basement. Um, so we did what they call a Flex Tech study where we did basically an energy study of this building and we had a set of recommendations for how to make upgrades to get some energy savings. Um, and so we had a proposal for the next step in, in how to actually firm up the design of what that project would look like. And then we thought, hey, wait a second, this is a 1970s building. There is asbestos in this building. So um, we brought, we worked the engineers to bring in uh, a hazmat consultant. Um, the idea was for him to come and do a study of, of Village Hall that would be pretty thorough so that we would really have a sense of what exists in terms of hazardous material throughout the building. Um, we know, for instance, it's in the um, mastic, in the tiles. Um, and just to reassure everyone, like we're safe sitting here in Village Hall, this is just, asbestos is when you just disturb the material that it becomes hazardous. So when you're doing things like construction projects, um, it needs to be treated very carefully. So the proposal that we got um, is $6,600 just to come and do the hazmat study. Okay. Um, so. This is what those things cost, I guess? Seems like a lot to me. Um, I don't know if now is the time I'm gonna undertake that, but I wanted to bring that to the board and share with you. That's what I came up with. Is, is that for the, the entire envelope of the building, including fire, or just our side? That is to do, so what that hazmat study would entail is um, actually boring holes, somewhere discreetly, <laughs> in the wall, to see if there's um, uh, asbestos material in the walls. Um, I, we think there might be asbestos along the joints of the pipes internally. Um, I, I can show you where they are. <laughs> yeah, um, and so that project, you know, the energy efficiency project, project, one of the pieces of the proposal we were interested in is providing more insulation in the roof because there's vents that lead straight out to the roof. It's, not tight at all. Um, so we would also ask them to look at the ceiling slash roof there. Um, and so yeah, I mean, if we if we found something in the wall right over here, it's probably over there in the firehouse. So really, this study is meant to be a holistic look at this building, whether it's the fire department that wants to do some construction, or whether it's us over here that wants to do some construction, or we want to do a whole systems wide project to the building. So it's, you know, it would it would be a nice thing to have right. if we ever want to make changes to the layout of this building or to the systems of this building. Um, Vanessa, you might want to look at when they put in the ADA lift, 
they can yes. do some asbestos abatement. We, we gave them that information. Oh, okay. Yes, yes. So exactly. Then, right on, Karen, because yeah, we can. dug that information up and that was part of the information oh, that they're okay. using. Just so you don't have to reinvent the wheel yep. if they've done a piece of it for you. And, and that fee was based on them having that, that report. Yeah. So that was helpful yeah. Yeah. to give them. And just to remind everybody, this is over and above the $15,000 for the architect fee to do the, to the, the work. Next, yeah, the next design phase. So, um, you know, I can make a motion for us to, to go forward with the hazmat study and just kind of you know, take care of that and then have that sitting on a shelf for if and when we need to do some renovations to this building or if and when we can undertake a larger upgrade to our systems. I think we'd, I'd like to look to see where we get the money, where we have the funding to be able to do that. Yeah. And uh, we haven't done, we haven't done a deep dive into, again, we're at our six month time, yeah. our window, we're gonna be doing a very deep analysis of our funding. Yeah, maybe this is, is something okay? we could discuss as part of even our budget conversations. Well, I'd like to bu bundle it with the 15,000 and the 6,000 and say, let's, if we have a package. So what's, what's the 15,000? So that's for the architectural renderings. That's for like the next design phase. Yeah. Of didn't, didn't you guys already approve that? Did you approve that? Yeah. yeah, I voted no, I think. <coughs> Not the 15000 I don't think we approved. I know you talked about it. I'm just asking because normally I would chime in and say, where are we going to get the money? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't think we approved the 15000 yet. I don't think we did. Yeah. Okay. So that's why I say I'd like to look at this yeah. as a package and say, because we need to do that part, the first part, the 6600 and yeah. then, you know, if that's feasible, yeah. and how can we go forward to keep the right. project moving right right yeah and i know there have been other conversations about you know does the fire department want to have another piece of a room here or something right. and for opening up walls and i think it, the budget is a good time to talk about it because we can also determine how involved the fire department wants to be and can we share the cost with the fire department with their budget as well okay so we're going to table this we'll table that okay. thank you Composting. Oh, um, okay, so update on the compost pilot. That program will be ending at the end of December. Um, it's been a, a great pilot. We've got a lot of good information. Um, as you know, I've applied for two grants to try to put together funds to build a compost facility. And um, I am a finalist. We are finalists in those grants. Oh, are we real? Oh, really? Yeah. Um, I actually... You found that out, huh? Today, I got an email from the contact for the DEC grant, which was uh, $200,000. She said, I think we're going to go into contract. Wow. So that's cool. exciting. And then the other grant wow. that I applied for, I asked for $100,000. Um, and they said that I'm a, a, a semi-finalist. I, my application is a semi-finalist, and uh, but it's contingent upon getting a yes from the DEC grant. Of course, yeah. So I mean, it's looking good. I don't want to count my chickens before they hatched, but uh, it's really exciting. Just for today, um, and I just wanted to mention all of the participants. We had 100 households um, who took part in this compost pilot, uh, and I want to thank them. Um, there are some who are really perturbed now that they're in the, in the habit of getting their scraps, um, uh, you know, not in putting their scraps in the garbage, they're perturbed to have to go back to that. So um, I am trying to put together some, some workarounds, um, not municipally funded, so I'm just kind of doing this privately as a neighborhood project, but I'm hoping we'll come up with something that could serve those people in the meantime. Um, so. Nice. Yeah. Okay. Um, what we alluded to before was our Route 9 cor corridor and uh, kind of the connection to the Astor Bridge okay. that was there. So uh, I'm going to turn this back over to Rick on something we started many months ago. Something even months. Yes, we actually started this um, uh, in November of uh, 2021. 
And um, at that, slightly before that, at that time, the mayor heard that Dutchess County uh, Transportation Council was um, willing to uh, select projects for complete streets analysis. Um, he went to uh, Dutchess County Transportation, and they agreed that they would take a look basically at the Route 9 corridor from uh, the Landsman Kill Bridge all the way to um, the intersection up by the hospital. And the idea is how do we look at these, how do we look at our streets to make them more bicycle, pedestrian friendly? Um, that's the theory, that's the theory, theory of complete streets. So I'm also on the transportation subcommittee for the um, a, a comprehensive plan committee. So the process was um, Dutchess County came here, uh, we walked and talked um, the entire corridor about what was possible, what was available, uh, what could be done. Uh, Dutchess County came back with a draft plan. Um, I then brought that actually to the Comprehensive Plan Committee members, who and then we walked the entire corridor, um, and uh, they had some comments and questions that they, that they put together. The final output is um, this study from, sorry, didn't get better, from uh, Dutchess County, Dutchess County Transportation Council. And these are ideas about what can be done to make this corridor more pedestrian, bicycle pedestrian friendly. Um, they're just ideas. And in order to take the ideas to a certain, to the next level, basically, what we have in front of us is a task order. And it's a task order to tie and bond to start doing some conceptual designs based upon what's here in the Dutchess County Transportation Proposal. The uh, general idea is Tyne Bodden's gonna do these conceptual designs, bring them out, make some nice renderings for us, and then we can bring them forth to the public and get feedback about what people think works or doesn't work, what they like or don't like. But this has been, um, you know, nothing was uh, in concert sometimes, but um, I've been trying to solicit um, uh, as much uh, information from the Comprehensive Plan Committee group as we possibly can. Um, they've already incorporated some of the ideas that were in the Dutchess County um, uh, Transportation Council document into their, their thinking. So um, this would be basically moving this along so that we can, uh, as a community, have a discussion about uh, what we think we would like to do to improve this cargo. I'd just like to read the last paragraph of the scope of work uh, for the public. Uh, and this is from the task uh, order number 2022-34. And this last par paragraph, following the village's approval of the gateway conceptual layout, we will develop a three-dimensional model of the improvements. The model will be further rendered to create a one graphical representation of each gateway. We will meet with the village to review and receive your feedback on preliminary renderings. Following the meeting, we will finalize renderings incorporating the village comments and the public comment what we said, we're gonna add public comment, and final renders will be provided to us in hard copy and PDF form that we can use then to go out to the broader audience. And so Time Prom will, will perform the scope of work, as noted above, not to exceed a fee of $15,000, and they will undertake to work on an hourly plus expense basis, and we will be billed in accordance with, the, with their billing rates. Um, so I worked with Karen to find out if funding for this as well, so we can do that. We currently have $54,000 in our parking capital fund, which is, you can kind of make the correlation since this is improving the corridor on Route 9, which improves some parking and interfacing with the bridge. And uh, what Rick mentioned is we're gonna to try to incorporate into the design, the bridge design as well, so you can see the total layout of the corridor from the bridge all the way up to all the way up to the hospital. Uh, so we could take the $15,000 from the capital fund project. So I'd like to make a motion that we continue working with this project uh, and hire Ty and Bond to deliver the graphical models for a fee of $15,000 using uh, the money from the parking capital fund. Second. Discussion. I look at this as a resource document and I don't want to be a killjoy, but it's 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 sort of, it's a it's the resource. It's a referral document, and if the subcommittee comes up and the final master plan adoption takes 25% of it, um, or if we 
took the, uh, the highway study and we had workshops and we came up with you know a smaller version of what people really want I would then take that to conceptual engineering because I don't want to take the whole thing into concept engineering if it's sort of like the I mean there was a roundabout they suggested a roundabout so I don't think it seems like it's premature to just put all of that into the engineering basket it's a resource it's a referral document, and it's very good. I like it. And there's some. Yeah, is there? There's there like one layer of editing more to do before it goes yeah. into the spending fifteen thousand on that. I, I don't. I don't want to design something that the master plan committee won't even adopt. I, I think. Well, I would say there's nothing. I mean, the, frankly, the master plan committee wants more <laughs> than, yeah. than what they're getting. Some of which is not particularly feasible. Um, so they are behind what's in this document. They're 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 good with with what's in here. Well, then um, I would rather like workshop. And and one of the important things about hear from the public. Sure. One of the important things about this document is that Dutchess County was working with the state and on a, on a state road, and so the state has a fair amount of say about what they are willing or not willing to do um, in this corridor. So some of the things like a roundabout um, are not, the state is really doesn't want to do that. <laughs> and right. it would take, um, even if we could, we'd have to, basically the intersections have to qualify to have a traffic light before they're even willing to consider a roundabout. Um, there were certainly, um, if we're talking about the north edge of town, um, space constraints that came up very quickly. Um, the uh, I can say that the the um, uh, the transportation uh, subcommittee they generally like roundabouts, but it didn't seem like in our walking and talking with Dutchess County that they were really going to be feasible in the, in these spots as as attractive as an option it is to some people. Um, well, that was just one example. Yeah, I mean the, yeah. the crosswalks with the ramps, like they're great if you can get funding, but. We have a document that we could maybe even get started with the grant request. So what we talked about um, was that document is quite wordy and has many options in it. And to condense that down to have a good workshop, we felt that we needed to have these renderings to be able to have the good discussions. Yeah, but that's a 15. Right. So yeah, I think you can, yeah, what you want to do first. I mean, the problem was working with the document because of all of the wording associated with it versus having a rendering to be able to go from. It'd be nice. Angela, to do some more photoshopping. <laughs> Angela's up for that. Yeah, yeah, interpretation of the state Pay requirements. Yeah, okay. Right. And uh, but I think the other point is no, that just to give an idea of the pub to the public, you know what I mean? Not to have it like an engineer. Yeah, like that's an ex those are expensive exhibits, fifteen thousand no. dollars. So no, no, really. I think we all can get what by description and you've seen these things. Um, that's okay then I would if the, my question then is how how what, what would be the way that you would see moving forward at this point if we don't if we don't well, do this step and bring some documents forth to people what, what would be the plan to move forward I mean we're just saying we're gonna wait what however long until the comprehensive plan committee comes out and then do it again or, or the, do it? this is a great referral document if we see the community development block grant come up and we want to try try for all the the crosswalks and the striping because that's a real cheap thing to slow down traffic and have 11 feet lanes and we can go in for a you know thirty thousand dollar grant request or something to do you know from terrapin to the hospital or whatever you know in segment it well we probably have to build it in segments anyway yeah. i mean if that's going to be something right there right. are other other that's my point in a way. like let's just do it segmentize that instead of design the whole thing up front and then take 25% or 20% of the pieces one at a time. So you want to say maybe concentrate on the south side versus the north side you're saying? What because the, the middle problem? is not being touched. The north Let's have workshops and see what the public and we decide. So I think the one of the elements that has come up with this in the comprehensive plan committee, the, the transportation subcommittee, is that there hasn't been a coherent 
vision mm. for what we want. And, and I, understand, I understand what you're saying. It's like, hey, we've got some really good ideas here. And let's be opportunistic in terms of the funding and the money. Um, but I can say from just like a pattern book for um, uh, um, a housing and, and, and historic design, people were talking about essentially a pattern book for streets. Um, right, and that this is almost like a template for where else the complete street pattern could fall. Right, so, so, so it gives us something to shoot for. It may take, you know, years to do this, but it puts it all out there. That would be my, that would be my, my um, uh, 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 reason to go forward is that there would be something that the community had seen, seen uh, was behind and then we knew that you know would be the goal of this and probably successive administrations to fulfill that plan. So I got a thought here. Um, since these are really meant to be the workshop documents, that's what they're for, to have the discussions and be the rendering. What if we go back and work with Time Bond and say, okay, Given this, what is the incremental fees then for making changes so we have a view of the total package, right? Because that's what these are for, to have workshops. So I'm agreeable to go back and say, hey, time bond, what can we, you know, how much would it cost to make these changes going forward based on the, based on the workshop so we end up with something? If you were in the workshop and you're showing a rendering of this element, you could say, and the price tag is. <laughs> yeah, right. So which one do you want to invest in? Right. And, but then we can say option one, option two, option three, and yeah. then kind of render it down. But that may require different, more work on their part. Yeah. And, I don't, and we don't have that picture yet. Yeah. So I, I would like to propose that we go back to them and okay. ask about a complete project okay. for rendering for workshopping. Because that's what they want to do. They want to guide us through the workshop. So yeah. Is everybody okay with that? But what we're really trying to move towards here is a um, coherent, vision for the Route 9 corridor. Right. Um, so that basically, you know, slow traffic to make it friendly for people to move through it. Uh, people on foot or people on bikes to move through it. And slow down traffic. And slow down traffic. It just seems like a super expensive way to get. You're, um, you're open for suggestions if you know how to do it cheaper. You're okay. designing. Yeah, I want to. Fair, fair, fair enough. enough. I mean, it's fine. Yeah. I, mean, I think we can table this. It's fine. But, yeah. you know, but I'm really glad to have the discussion because these things have been bubbling in various places, Dutchess County uh, Transportation Council, uh, Comp Plan Subcommittee, and there's been a lot of ideas floating yeah. around, yeah. and it, it seems like we can begin to draw some of these things together. Yes. And you remember, the goal was to kind of merge it with the bridge as well. Yeah. I mean, so we were looking at the whole thing, not just pieces. Yeah. Okay. No, I love All that right. idea. I my point is, I think we know what these things look like. I know. Okay. 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 So, well, let's move on. I'm sorry. What did you say, Jerry? No, I said I don't understand it. So you may have a better no, visual I than I do. All right. All right. So, so we'll table. All right. So moving on. Um, next subject is on the grants. Uh, I just want to give an update that the uh, the Autism Supporter Committee did receive from the Thomas Thompson Trust a twenty thousand dollar matching grant which means now the committee is now gonna be focused on trying to do some fundraising to meet their goal um, for their projects, which really was close to $50,000. Uh, but we're very thankful to have received from the Thompson Trust um, the $20,000 grant uh, proposal for as a matching grant. And you'll see very shortly what we wanna do for getting some funding. Okay. Next, watch guard trade-up. This is from PCA. We have a request to improve our watch guard, which is our firebox coming in for security, and the total amount of the request is $1,374. Um, it's highly recommended by watch guard that we improve this to improve our security uh, for our internet services within the building. I'd like to make a motion to approve the watch guard upgrade for $1,374. Second. Any questions? All in favor say aye. 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 Okay. Grant, uh, Grant, system distribution pump. Yes, yeah, so this is the um, the slow shutdown valves. After the pumps, uh, they need to be uh, serviced in apparently solenoid valves. And some other things. They need they need to be um, overhauled. 
So I have a bid here for seven thousand three hundred and four dollars from Ross Bell. Uh, it's you know it's something that's pressing. The, the water is like going back into the clear well, and it's, the, the pumps are going on a lot longer than they should. And it's a higher energy bill, et cetera. Burn out bid. I I don't know. I mean, if they were oh, eventually, yeah, yeah. yeah. They're, they're, they're running, they're running more. Yeah, they're short cycling. Like, yeah. yeah. So. so do you need a second? Yeah. Second. Seven thousand three hundred four dollars. All in favor say aye. 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 No pass. And why we you you uh, got me here? We do have an, an intern's prospect from Barb to do the water line. Um, <laughs> her name is Ash Snow. And she wants to get started, so I would just like to make a motion that we would use Ash for no more than a thousand dollars for the to get started on this project. And she said she could work in as a summer intern also. Yeah. So, so we verbally have all re agreed to go forward with this right externally, so that's great. But I'd just like to get a motion Second. public for the all in favor say aye. Ash. Aye. 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 All right. Okay, next special request. And this is what I alluding to before, um, the Chamber of Commerce is going to be taking over the, from the Taste of Rhinebeck, uh, which will be held on April uh, 26th of 2023 at the Walkable Trail of Culinary Delights featuring restaurants, spirits, and specialty food retailers. This will be a ticketed fundraising event with 50% of the event proceeds to be donated to the Village of Rhinebeck for use by the Village Autism Supporter Committee and the other 50% will be used by to support the Rhinebeck Chamber of Commerce. Uh, so I'd like to make a motion to, the reason they're doing that now for April 26th, as you know, is because they want to start the advertising and then start get doing on that. So I'd like to make a motion to approve the Rhinebeck Area Chamber of Commerce event application for the Taste of Rhinebeck. Second. Any questions? I'd like to talk to them about shouting out all the all the restaurants that are doing composting. Yeah, very good. Yeah. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay. Next, minutes approval for eleven eight twenty two. I'd like to make a motion to approve the minutes uh, for eleven eight twenty two as presented by the village clerk. Second. Any questions? All in favor say aye. 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 So moved. All right. Rick, anything on the tree commission? Yep, a couple elements from the tree commission. Um, first of all, I just want to um, just return to the fall planting that we did as the um, village uh, corridor beautification tree restoration project. Um, this was again funded with a generous grant from the Frost Memorial uh, Foundation. And um, I'd like to just um, point out that we had a great crew of volunteers and they're gonna get their names read. And if you, excuse me if um, I butcher your name. Um, Walter Cotter um, distributed trees and stakes. Tom Johnson, Lydia Slavery drove the water truck. Mm -hmm. um, Ed Crawford, Derek Mason, Vanessa Pertozzi, Carly Fracoli? Fracaroli. Fracaroli, thank you very much. Emily Stern, Mark First, Pat Evans, Kathleen Evans, Andrew Hunter, Patrick and Heather Kelly, and their daughter Addison and son McLean, Michael Florenza, uh, Owen McGetterick, uh, Joyce Messenger, Mary Burns, Steve Sansola, Umberto Guerrero, Tom Johnson, Connie Lone, Taka Chess, Christopher Tavener, Dodd Crane, Mary Casey, Michael Slaby, the Interact Club also showed up, or members of the Interact Club showed up. They helped all mulch to all of our locations and uh, get it placed. And that was June Nathan, Francis Nathan, Malcolm Stewart, Noah Roger, Olivia Pulver, and Roxanne Clark. Um, so I can just say it was really um, a terrific and productive day. Um, there are still some trees to be planted in the spring. Um, along Route 9. Um, the reason for the staggering is that there are just some trees that cannot be successfully transplanted in the fall. They have to be transplanted in the spring. So there will be another batch of trees going in. That's all going to be professionally, um, professionally installed. So this has been um, a terrific project um, and I really hope that people appreciate that we're um, moving, we're, we're growing things for the future. Hopefully that'll have a good, long, um, Good long life cycle there. 
Um, the uh, commission also received uh, one application. This is from Nine Livingston Street, and it's a little bit different than normal. Basically, um, it's to apply a growth regulator to the uh, crab, the crab apple trees in front of the house, because basically the tree is sending out lots of crab apples, and it's a mess. So um, this was a topic of a fair amount of discussion at the um, uh, at the tree commission. Um, but basically, what was determined is that this is a uh, pretty commonly used, or, or that this kind of technique is actually pretty commonly used. This is not anything out of the um, out of the ordinary. Basically, it happens in orchards all the time. So. Um, the Tree Commission um, uh, uh, re approved uh, that a certified arborist um, does some of the pruning on the trees and that uh, a growth regulator um, can be used this year and uh, that any future uh, application um, will have to be um, discussed once again. So it was a little bit, um, uh, it, you know, it was, was a bit of a topic, what does it mean, have a growth regulator and enhancing it, but basically it's determined that this is um, not an environment, you know, not its environmental impact is, is, is no. Um, and then the discussion is we'd like to see an application for the regulator, maybe one other so we understand what's going in there, and then if it's going to be an annual um, thing, then we would not, ha not have, to do a, have to do a permit application every year. So um, that's a long way of saying I'd like to uh, make a motion that the board accepts the um, review, uh, the, the commission's review of the application from Nine Livingston for pruning and the application of growth regulator to crab apple trees. Second. Thank you. All in favor say aye. 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 Oh, good. Very good. Vanessa, climate smart. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the town of Rebeck also has a climate smart task force and they're looking for volunteers. So if anybody's interested, you can reach out. Um, and uh, and uh, yeah, they're looking for folks who are interested in working on climate change at the local level. Um, and I'm looking forward to collaborating with the town. Um, the uh, Climate Smart Rhinebeck Village Task Force has been invited to be part of a special event at Star Library on January 5th from 6 to 8 p.m. This, uh, this workshop will be hosted by Sustainable Hudson Valley. This is a local nonprofit that works on climate related activities in the Hudson Valley. We're going to be discussing some of the potential recommendations for the comp plan that relate to climate change. And Sustainable Hudson Valley has um, developed a whole toolkit for how local municipalities can look at what needs to be done regionally statewide and sort of line every, align everything. So the public is welcome, it's a free event, come and help workshop these ideas. Um, we finally, I think we're gonna be starting our greenhouse gas emissions inventory in January. This was delayed ever since COVID. So this is exciting, it's finally gonna happen. Um, this is called CAPI. We're part of nine municipalities that got a grant to be able to do this together as a cohort. Um, and just also want to mention that Mayor Bassett and I went to Marist College and we sat in on the final presentation of the Marist students who have been studying flooding along with the Landsman Kill um, and are developing a predictive dashboard about flooding. And we saw their final presentations. It's always a pleasure to go see the young, the young people who are trying to help out the village. It's, it's really cool they've built this piece by piece from doing the initial study yeah. to doing the initial installations. I mean, it's taken a number of years, but it's been a great project for them. And it was, again, it was a good long distance vision and it's really starting to, to bear fruit. Yeah, so. and every semester they have to document their work so that it can be passed on to the next semester. So it's a really cool project. This, and then it's going to continue. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. we're not at an end. We're not done, no. But I think right. it's so wonderful. It's a great vision from Marist, and they've had the tenacity to see it through. They actually like doing a real project. Right. No, no, no. I remember it from the yeah. start, from the get-go. Yeah. It's really good. Okay, we're going to skip the comprehensive plan unless anybody has any updates for that since Lydia's not here. 
Uh, we, I would like to make a motion to approve the vacation buyout request for employee number five for 48 hours. Second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 So passed. And so I'd like to make a motion to adjourn our last meeting for 2022 at 7.55. I wish everybody a happy holiday. Second. 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 All in favor say aye. 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 Happy New Year.